Okay, so what we just did is we saw uh, what the possible world's theory of propositions says that, pro that um, propositions are. They're just sets of possible worlds. Um, before we go on to apply these ideas to epistemological ideas like knowledge and belief, we're going to just explore a little bit more some features of the theory of propositions as possible worlds. Um, because I want to see, want you to sh see exactly why, you know, some, some people like this theory and some of the nice features of it, that it has. Um, before we do that, it's helpful just to remember some very basic facts about Venn diagrams. So this is something you'll probably have done, I don't know, maybe, maybe even in elementary school. But you'll be remember diagrams like these. They're, you know, they're pictures of various sets. Um, let's just call this set A and this set B. So there are a number of certain basic relationships between sets pictured here. So one thing you can see is that the sets overlap. And we'll call the area where they overlap, this area, their intersection. So that's the intersection. You can also think about the region you get by just pooling all the sets, both sets together. Um, so that will be the region I'm shading in green. This is the region you get by taking A and putting it together with B. And this is what's called the union of A and B. The union. Um, and then finally, this is maybe a slightly harder to think about, but once you've fixed on a particular area, like or a particular set, like A, you can think about what's called the complement of A, which is just everything outside of A. So let's draw that as the red bit. The red bit is everything outside of A. And notice that it includes some of B. So this is the complement. The reason why um, it's important to look at these things is because using these ideas, these relationships between sets, the possible worlds theory propositions gives us a really nice, really straightforward theory of what we might call logically complex propositions. So I'm going to call logically complex propositions, they're ones that we get, use say the word not to express them or 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 and. So like not P is complex, P and Q is complex, P or Q. Those are all complex in this sense. And what we'll see in a second is that each of these things corresponds basically to one of the ideas that we just introduced. Okay, so let's see an example to think about that. So let's take even a slightly simpler example than the dice case. We can think about the question, um, is it sunny out? Is it sunny? And this is going to divide the worlds into two classes. There's going to be one class where, where of worlds where it is sunny and one where it isn't. So let's draw our dots in to represent our possible worlds. There's going to be one set of possible worlds where it's sunny. Let's pretend it's this one. These are all the worlds where it's sunny. And these are the ones where it's not. So I will shade this in green. Let's also think about because we're going to be thinking about or or and, it's, it'd be nice to have two propositions. Let's also think about the question, is it windy? And let's imagine that the, these worlds on the bottom are the ones where it's windy, and the ones on the top are, ones, are, are where it's not windy. So the blue is where it's windy. 
So remember this green area, I'll draw a line, I'll draw around it just so it's a little bit clearer. This is the proposition that it's sunny because these are the worlds. These are all in exactly the worlds where it's sunny. This proposition is the is the set. This proposition is the set. This is the proposition that it's windy because it's the set of worlds where it's windy. Okay, so now that we have the proposition that's sunny, what is the proposition? It's not sunny. We know what proposition. We know what the proposition that's sunny is. It's just this region. What is the proposition that it's not sunny? And when you look at it, this theory just gives you a really obvious answer for what for what it is. It's just well, you look at the worlds where it's sunny, and the worlds where, and the proposition that's not sunny is just whatever's left over. So if this is all the worlds where it's sunny, if this is the proposition that it's sunny, then this region over here has to be the proposition that it's not sunny. So I'll do red around it. That's the proposition that it's not sunny. So in fact, not just corresponds to complement. Remember we saw a moment ago, the complement of a set is just the region outside of that set. Negation, negating a proposition to find that to find what the negation of a proposition is, you just look at its complement, or at least that's the obvious theory of how it should go on the possible worlds theory. Okay, so negation is just complement. Let's think about or now. What does or correspond to? What set of world? We know what set of worlds. We know what the proposition it's sunny is. We know what the proposition it's windy is. Can we find the proposition that it's either sunny or windy? And the answer again is actually yes. If you think that set, that propositions are sets of possible worlds, there's a really obvious answer for what that should be. It's just you take, so remember this is the proposition that it's sunny, this is the proposition that it's windy, you get the proposition that it's either sunny or windy by just getting the union of these two things, by putting them together. So I'm going to draw around it in black. <coughs> so this whole region, I don't have COVID, this whole region is the region where it's sunny or windy. And in general, disjunction just amounts to unioning. So if you have two propositions, you form the disjunction by just unioning the two sets together. So, so far we have uh, negation equals complement and or equals union. Finally, let's think about and We have the proposition that it's sunny, we have the proposition that it's windy. What is the proposition that it's sunny and windy? Well, again, when you think about it, it's the answer is the this way of thinking about it gives you an obvious answer. It's just the area where they overlap. So remember, this is the proposition that's sunny, this is the proposition that's windy. They overlap here. So this is the area, i.e., this is the world, this is the set of worlds where it's sunny and windy. So of course, this overlap is going to be their conjunction. It's going to be the proposition that it's sunny and windy. So in other words, and equals intersection. So this is the nice feature of the, propos of the possible worlds theory propositions. We have these important logical notions of negation, disjunction, conjunction, on the possible worlds theory propositions, these correspond to just really simple ideas about sets. Negation is just complementation, or is just union, and and is intersection. Now you'll see on the handout that I've given you a few slightly more ex complex examples of propositions. I've given you pairs of them, and, and you're to work out whether they're the same or different. Um, and the way you'll do that is just by working through the definitions of or and you know applying the definitions to the things and seeing seeing what comes out. So I'm going to let but I'm going to let you work through that yourselves and then we're going to talk through the answers uh, on Wednesday. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the first nice thing about the possible worlds theory about propositions. It gives you a way of thinking, a really simple way of thinking about what these notions, these logical notions are. But that's not the only notion it gives you analysis of. In fact, it gives you an analysis of what, of the notions of necessity and possibility. So just thinking about it in terms of uh, intuitive terms, um, we all the time distinguish between things that are possible and things that are not possible. So for instance, you know, going back to our dice example, one thing that's possible is for the dice to come up six. Maybe one thing that's impossible is for it to come up seven because, you know, it's a six-sided dice. It can't come up seven if it's a six-sided dice. Um, so there are these important notions of possibility and impossibility. Um, there's also the, the concept of necessity. So if you have a six-sided dice, it's, necess it's necessarily going to land on one of the numbers, one through six. So necessarily, either it's going to land on one, two, three, four, five, or six. Um, so we have possibility, necessity, and impossibility. And in fact, once you have the possible worlds theory, um, it's just very straightforward to say what these things amount to. Um, so let me give you a simple example, a simple picture. I'm going to draw our square. You're going to be seeing a lot of these squares, so buckle up. Draw our dots again. Let's think about the proposition that the dice lands on one. Well, of course, there's going to be some worlds where that happens. Let's imagine that this is one of them. Dice lands one here. Now, that's not the only world where that happens, but it's, it's one of the worlds where it happens. Um, and this is basically just what it means to say something is possible on this theory. It's just for there to be a world where it's true. So, possibly P, that's the same as saying there's some world where P is true. What about necessity? Well, let's th take an example of something that's necessary. Um, I'll use a simple, a, a more simple example. Uh, let's take an example of a logical truth. So it's a logical truth that either it's sunny or that it's not sunny. One of those two things has to be true. Um, sunny or not sunny. This proposition is true in every single world, because the, every world is exactly one of these two things. Either it's a world where it's sunny, or it's a world where it's not sunny. So it's true in every single world in here. And that's what it, just, what it means for something to be necessary. It's just for it to be true in all worlds. So necessarily P means that P is true in all worlds. <clears throat> Finally, we talked about the notion of impossibility. Let's take another example of something that's impossible. Let's now take a, a logical false, falsehood. So it's sunny and not sunny. <coughs> That's a proposition that's logically false. It, ca it can't be both. You can be exactly. You can be at most, and in fact, you have to be exactly one of them. And this is a proposition that's not true anywhere here. Um, so, so that and that's in fact what it means for something to be uh, necessarily false or impossible on this theory, just for it not to be true anywhere. Um, P is impossible. means P is false everywhere. So this is the second benefit that we have of this theory of propositions. Uh, there are these natural notions of necessity, possibility, impossibility. When you start thinking about things in terms of possible worlds, 
you just have a really straightforward example of what these things mean. For something to be possible is for there to be some possible world where it's true. For something to be necessary is for it to be true in every possible world. And for it to be impossible is for it to be not true anywhere. As you'll see in the handout, I'm asking you to do two things. Two que there's two questions I want you to think about. Uh, one question is about the relationship between possibility and necessity. Because as a matter of fact, um, once you have one of these two, one of these things, you can automatically define the other out of it. So if you, for instance, if you know what possibility is, it's straightforward to define necessity out of possibility. So I'm going to let you think about that for yourselves and see how that might go. We'll take up the question on Wednesday. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to think about the question, how many necessary propositions are there? Because in fact, there's a precise answer to this question on the possible worlds theory of how many necessary propositions there are. So I want you to think about that because this is actually importantly related to um, a worry that people have about this theory. So the treatment of necessary propositions is actually something that, as we'll talk about on Wednesday, people are actually worried about. So see if you can answer that question for yourselves. When I talk about entailment, what I mean is just the very ordinary notion of saying that one thing follows from another. Um, so for instance, if I say that it's sunny and windy, it just follows that it's sunny. If it's sunny and windy, it has to also be the case that it's sunny. Uh, or for instance, um, if uh, everyone is, you know, if everybody is a, is a person, um, then it follows that maybe that somebody is a person. Um, so entailment is importantly a relationship between propositions. Um, and actually it's a relationship between propositions that's really easy to see, again, how it works given the possible worlds theory of propositions. Um, so before we do that, just so like we did or or not, let's just look at a simple relationship between sets that's going to help us understand how this works. <clears throat> so we'll one more time draw our, Zen, our Venn diagram. And here we'll have two sets, one within the other. Let's call this A, we'll call that B. Um, in this diagram, B is what we'll call a subset of A. Um, what that means is that everything that's in B is also in A. So B is a subset of A, just in case everything in B is in A. So again, this is a very simple relationship between sets, one thing, something you'll, again, have probably seen in school, though that may have been a while ago. Funnily enough, this really simple relationship between sets is actually just all that entailment amounts to in um, the possible worlds theory propositions. Entailment is just the subset relation. Or put differently, one proposition entails another, just in case it's a subset of the other one. Let's um, work through again an example now to see that a little bit more clearly. <clears throat> so we have our picture again. Let's say this is the proposition that it's sunny. This is the proposition that it's windy. Let me draw those. Sunny. We have the overlap already. And we've already seen that this is the this intersection is the proposition that it's sunny and windy. Now we already know that the proposition that it's sunny and windy obviously entails that it's sunny. If it's sunny and windy, it has to be sunny. And in fact, that, pro that relationship is represented here because notice that uh, the set of worlds where it's sunny and, sunny and windy is a subset of the worlds where it's sunny. Every world where it's sunny and windy is also, of course, a world where it's sunny. And that is exactly just what entailment amounts to on this theory. 
<clears throat> for one proposition to entail another is just for it to be a subset of the other. So uh, P entails Q just in case P is a subset of Q. We can boil that down a little bit more because we actually just saw what the definition of subset is. That just means that, i.e., every world in P is also in Q. That's just what it is for one proposition to entail another. It's for uh, the first one to be a subset of the, a subset of the other. Uh, let's just take one more example. Uh, quickly do our dice example again. Let's think about or. So uh, this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's another example. This is like maybe more of a logician's example, but if the if the dice landed on one, then it must have either landed on one or two, because if it, if it landed on one, that's enough to show that it either landed on one or two. So, landed on one entails landed on two. And again, that's represented here, because. The proposition that it landed on one or two is just the union of those two things. And the proposition that it landed on one is just this bit. And the blue bit is obviously a subset of the, of the red bit. So again, we see again an example showing us that on the possible worlds theory propositions, entailment is for one proposition to entail another is just for the subset relation to hold between the two of them. Um, you can see on the handout I've given you a way of, so that we just focus on examples of one proposition entailing another, but you can also think of examples of multiple propositions together entailing something. And that happens, that goes in a very straightforward way, but I'll just let you read through that yourself. The one thing I just want to mention before I go on uh, and, and wrap up this segment is just something that's a little bit counterintuitive about this way of thinking about entailment. Um, because you might think, so let's draw a little picture again, a really simple one, and we'll keep this really quite abstract. So this is one proposition and this is another one. This will take maybe take a little bit of time to get used to, but if you were to look at this, your instinct might be to say that this is a picture which shows that B entails A. So you might think, well, this shows that B entails A. But that's actually not right. So it's very tempting when you see these diagrams to think that, well, the bigger one, the bigger, the bigger region has got to be the stronger proposition. It's got to be the one doing the entailing. This is very intuitive, but it's actually false. It's actually the op completely the opposite way around. It's always that if, if one region is within another, it's the smaller one that's doing the entailing. <clears throat> and this is kind of counterintuitive, but generally the picture is that the smaller the region, the more information it's including. A way to think about this is maybe you think like at the very limit, the smallest possible region is just an individual world. But remember, an individual world has much more information in it than like a region like this. Because a region like this is just a, it's like a normal possibility that doesn't settle every question. Whereas a world is something that does settle every question. So while your instinct might be that the bigger regions have more information than the smaller regions, it actually goes exactly the opposite way around. And the way to remember this is just think, well, remember the points are the possible worlds, and the possible worlds contain the most possible information. So it's always that the smaller regions are the ones that entail the bigger regions, rather than the other way around. 
So that's just to help. So that'll be something you probably just have. You'll, you'll spend a little bit of time to percolate. Um, it'll be helpful to work through some examples, but remember that this is something it's, it's worth remembering that this is a little bit counterintuitive or it might seem counterintuitive. Um, but I do assure you when you think through it, it makes sense. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the second segment there. What we did, the purpose here was to just explore a little bit more the, how the possible worlds theory propositions works, some nice features it has that people have talked about. So we saw one nice feature is that it gives us a very simple theory about what things like or and not and and mean. They just correspond to these really simple relationships between sets. We saw that it gives you a very straightforward theory about what it means to say that something is necessary or possible or impossible. And finally, we saw that it gives you a very, a, a very neat, although slightly counterintuitive, but makes sense when you think about it, theory of what it means to say that one proposition follows from another or what it means for one proposition to entail another. Okay, so that's all from this segment. In the next segment, we're going to start looking about, at some actual epistemological stuff, namely how this treats belief and knowledge.